I first of all want to thank you all for coming this evening to the opening of, of Gay Bartolos' Obsession and Abhorrence exhibition here at the University Art Museum. My name is Chris Goes. I'm the museum director here. And we have been planning this exhibition for the past two years. Mm -hmm. And it's been an absolute privilege to work with Gabe on, on his first museum show. And really, it's an exhibition that looks at 20 years of his work. Gabe, you want to talk a little about how this piece got made, your relationship with Matthew on this particular work? Yeah, this. Um was for Cree Master 3, and still to this date, even though the film is 13 years old now, is probably still one of the most exciting job opportunities we've had. Matthew was real specific in that he wanted um, 10 zombie horses, two representing each of the Cree Master films. And um, uh, I, I was luckily way more excited about the artistic opportunities than I was intimidated about how to do it. Uh, it it, I went through different thoughts of, well, I can't adhere things to horses. I knew they were going to be running, and I know that horses are just completely punishing on everything. So I devised that the, the um, prosthetics would actually be attached to spandex material. That spandex then could be attached to the horse in very form-fitting suits. And that really became the challenge of the job was to architecturally engineer a suit that was made in three parts, a head and a hood, the uh, torso section and the legs that snapped on in about 20 minutes. And the idea was, though that Matthew had a lot to set up, he didn't want to be waiting for this elaborate effect. When he was ready to shoot, he wanted them on. So we tested in Los Angeles a friend at a horse, so we went to their ranch, and I first just tested the spandex suit with nothing on it. We videotaped it. I sent photographs and video to Matthew. We both got excited about it, and we realized, hey, this might work. Then I added a, a layer of bone, foam rubber bone, that would still be flexible, but give the illusion of a hard material. That worked great, did not inhibit the horse, and then I got more aggressive with the build of adding the muscles and the torn skin, and um, we ran it through its final paces, and, and we realized this is going to work. Um, what I wanted to avoid was to mass produce an error because there was a lot of work going into these. So then I ramped up a big team of artists and technicians and for about eight months we began building in my then Somar California studio an army of horses and it was just a, a, a wonderfully bizarre experience to watch these carcasses coming to life and um, uh, it when we ended up shooting it, it was great because a lot of what you see on here is stuff we added at the very last minute to shooting. We lathered them up with slime, we added some blood, and then um, there was some uh, fog rolled in from Mother Nature, other the production provided, and um, it just led to an amazing three days of filming, of watching these things uh, do their thing. It was pretty amazing. So for this show, um, we wanted to have a lot of things represented here from installment to sculptural pieces to just tour de forces and this was something I, I'm still very proud of and um, thought it would be a great thing to rebuild from scratch. So all these pieces came from the original molds that have been archived away. So you're really looking at a, a, a genuine reproduction about as close as it's going to get of, of these horses. So um, yeah, he holds this space nicely. <laughs> But these, these other three works that sort of broach the gallery this way are from Gabe's upcoming film, St. Bernard, and I'm going to let him talk about the plot, the synopsis, and exactly what's taking place here. Um, as Chris said, St. Bernard is literally in its uh, final weeks of completion. I wrote, produced, and directed the film. It follows a, a classical musical composer's Descent into Madness. Um, I think uh, my curiosity about um, much has been spoken about creativity, um, mental imbalance, uh, how they're all very close partners and sometimes people find are victim of tipping points and stuff. I wanted to explore some of that um, as, as in a way to make a narrative for a film. So we focus on a, a creative 
character, and um, he begins to descend into madness. And the film is really that journey to follow him. And what I wanted to do is try and utilize the different tools that cinema allows to speak the vocabulary to the viewing audience of this descent. And um, a lot of it is obviously through the visuals. And um, the idea is that the, our hero begins to see the world in a very different way, but it becomes a very normal way for the viewing audience to see it. And um, at one point, he goes for help at a police station. And um, this is uh, the major set from the police station that we recreated here. And the idea is that um, he gets no help from the police station. The police station is just a mess of overcomplicated, non-functioning bureaucracy. Um, you know, just think DMV or anything like that. And it's, this is a metaphor for that. And we follow along with this poor guy as whether it's either in his head or a reality, these are some of the sets he encounters. Um, I shot the film over a long period of time and I was conscious that a lot of the joy would be the journey. I didn't want to give myself hard deadlines so that if a set began to get really detailed and organic, I went with it. And it allowed me to maybe build sets that I might not normally have the luxury with hard deadlines of get into a soundstage, build, get out. And that allowed for me to really explore the depth and the layering I wanted to convey in this guy's mind as it gets busier and busier uh, with insanity. Um, later in the film, <clears throat> he meets a character out in the desert pushing this baby carriage. Uh, wood becomes a metaphor in the film for oppression, and it starts light in the film and builds and builds, and whether a person's, person is conscious of it or not, by the end of the film, it is just a mosaic of wood closing in on him. Uh, at the end of the film, without giving anything away, he ends up at his music mentor's home, who begins to go through an unexpected transformation from happy mentor to perverted villain as he transforms into a music monster. And um, I found on my own projects that I produce and write and then direct, I, I can consciously try and do things I haven't seen before in other films. Uh, the nice thing is you could compete at any financial level or any studio with your imagination. And um, I, I thought, wow, I haven't seen a music monster before. I'm a fan of instruments and a fan of creature transformations, so it was a good fit. And we have on display here the four primary stages the character went through. And it's in a set that is, again, filled in with wood and a tight mosaic. So we use the opportunity of Chris um, encouraging me to, to, to look at part of this show as an installation, and that's what we did. We had the key props, the trophies, the lights, and kind of blended them into the set to become a, a very natural framing for the pieces. Um, and over on the right of that are three hairy stick figures, which um, maybe less said the better. <laughs> And there's one other piece in the museum which we'll, we'll briefly touch upon, which is on the other side of that wall, which is a piece uh, that, that Gabe just finished also sure, for sure. rail trucks. And we should talk a little bit about that. We'll stay here, and then I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes to ask questions of Gabe. Mm -hmm. So, Right on the other side of the wall, uh, a famous celebrity photographer called Mark Seliger, his side project is a country western band. And he has a brand new album that just came out. And to celebrate it, he reached out to 12 filmmaker, artist, photographers. <clears throat> I was one of them. And he gave us each one of the songs. And he said, do whatever you want with it. Visualize it. And some of the artists did a photo montage. Others did animation. <clears throat> I chose to create a creature for it and um, do a film narrative. We shot in Super 16 film. I've been conscious that Mark Seliger for years has been giving the world beautiful images. So I was a little intimidated. Yikes, I got to make this really good for him. So we shot in film. We, we dealt with it like a little film shoot and kind of went for it. And it's a um, three and a half minute country western song, um, but in my film, a uh, sweet woman in a lonely cabin invites in a horned demon on a rainy night. And they sit and dine together, and then um, it kind of goes the expected way if you dine with the devil. So uh, what we did is we had built a really elaborate suit um, for the character. We have it on display on the other side of the wall. And next to it is I wanted to, 
to maybe let the viewing public understand some of the steps that we get to a finished piece. So there with a the bronze finish is the sculpture of the head right out of the mold. It has the horns attached and people could begin to make the connection that um, sometimes the sculpture pieces very much stand on their own as a piece of art, even though in the uh, world of film, you're asking to take it to the full finished cosmetic level. I sometimes like showing both off to let people know the different levels of art that we like celebrating with a show like this. I have to tell you, over the past two years, we've had some incredible conversations, ones that I never thought we would have within the museum context. So it's been an incredible opportunity for me work to work with Gabe and have his work here at the museum. But I also want to give you guys an opportunity in this sort of private setting to ask Gabe any questions about his work that you may have. Um, the meaning of the crosses in St. Bernard, there are, um, when you do your own film, you, you have a lot of room to explore some of your own soapboxes, maybe. And some of them you may personally believe or you may find completely fit the character in itself. The character in the film gets a few letdowns through organized religion. And it shows itself sometimes in very obvious ways in a sequence in a church. That's where the money suit comes from. You get pretty literal there. Um, while other times, there is sometimes the weight and the drag of a cross shows itself in scenes. Um, you know, anytime you put a message like that out, whether you believe it or not, you set yourself up a little bit, and for me, it's, I would rather have people find their own meaning into films, <clears throat> yet sometimes it's good to leave little seeds for people to pick on, and some people may even run with it even further. Um, this character was running into very different, different types of disappointment through the established authority, established religion, and signs of that show up in different ways. The question was to where does all this stuff come from? I, I love getting dirty with the stuff, and I will sometimes design characters or sets based on abundance of things. There is, with, with our booming industrialized, industrialized society, there is huge discard of waste. I would go to construction sites, and dumpsters would be full with hundreds, thousands of dollars of wood being thrown away. So I knew, narratively, wood was going to represent a thematic choice. So it, it fit budget-wise terrifically. It's everywhere. And um, so specifically, I would go to construction sites. I would go to um, trash dumpster areas. And um, so that's where a lot of the raw architecture come from. The keys, in it. The keys it was funny, because I, I had been saving the keys for two, three years, and I thought I was really cool because I had about 200. I was like, woo! And then at this really weird thrift store right near the studio were these boxes with thousands of them. And suddenly, it was one of those things where if you shoot long enough and take your own time, things come to you. And, and you, you're like, wow, this is kind of meant to be, or it's telling you where to go. And the visuals of the keys played right into authority, a police chief. And instead of it being a, a, a piece I would have to zero in on to do a close-up shot to make it big, I was able to literally blanket it with it. And um, it became a real textural element. Um, yeah, I did a lot of illustration and uh, have always enjoyed that. I think um, I got really interested in cinema. And uh, I liked film. And I liked drawing and painting. And then I began to like sculpting. And then I started to realize the films I liked, a lot of them had effects in them. So my father had a Super 8 camera, and he would let me borrow it. So I began to film my own scenarios with the work in it. And that pairing was really fascinating, because you were able to control all these moving parts to try and tell a story. And um, by completing this second feature, it's exciting for, him, for me because film is a language. And um, as, as any form of getting eloquent, you try and learn that language and maybe try and convey stuff through different aspects. Um, you know, not always maybe a straight line. And I think that appeals to different people. So um, doing a film and being a makeup effects artist is great because it allows for all the things I enjoy drawing, painting, sculpting, mold making, fabrication, all under one umbrella. It's, it's great that way. Was there one particular film you went to see as a child that, you, that was a sort of a catalyst for you in terms of your career? Um, 
a lot of Japanese horror films were really exciting. I mean, as a child, I knew they were fake, but I thought how cool they've built this entire realistic city, right. and now they stepped all over it in a creature suit. They crushed it. That's cool, um, and then filmed it, so it wasn't a waste. Um, films like The Exorcist uh, were very impactful. I think are still disturbing to this day. So, seeing it at 14, 15, 16, that stuff resonates and. Um, very quickly you take the thrill of being scared and uh, start to understand there's a craft and a, a science behind it. And that fusion is what could be really exciting.